Welcome everyone to today's webinar on building family professional partnerships. I am Jerry Clark with the University of Illinois at Chicago Division of Specialized Care for Children hosting the webinar today. DSCC is the Title V program for children with special health care needs in Illinois. This webinar is being recorded and will be available shortly at the division's website dscc.uic.edu. The PowerPoint presentation is available to download in the handout box on the right hand, lower right hand side of your screen. You'll see there's both a PowerPoint and a PDF, it's the same presentation in either version. All participants will be muted so that extraneous noise can be avoided. Please send any questions through the chat box in the lower right hand corner of the screen. We will address questions at the end of the presentation. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Dorelia Rivera has a daughter with special health care needs and has developed partnerships with all of her daughter's providers, some of which are local and others are not. She has worked to influence policy for individuals with special health care needs in a number of positions at various organizations, including in state government. She is currently the Director of Government Programs at Blue Cross Blue Shield Health Care Service Corporation. Dorelia? Hello, everyone. First, I just want to say thank you for joining us on this uh, webinar today. Um, feel free to ask questions along the way. Um, I would like this to be an interactive presentation. I've presented at other venues before, but this one always is a little bit different for me um, in a good way. It's, it's more personal. So um, I may veer off a little bit from the actual PowerPoint, but um, as we go throughout the presentation, again, feel free to ask questions to stop me, um, and then at the end we will have a formal time for questions. So I'll start a little bit uh, with just um, my daughter, our, a little bit of my background, a little bit about who I am in order to be able to, to present to you. So what, you'll see on the, what you see on the screen right now is my daughter in the middle. Um, her name is Kayla, and she has... Um, She's been my inspiration for doing a lot of the work that I've done um, throughout the years. So she, I'll tell you a little bit more about our story and kind of um, where, we, where we've been and how we are where we are today. Okay. So here are some disclaimers before we start the formal presentation. So the goal of the, of the webinar, um, building family professional partnerships, it's basically to, it's for family members and professionals, and um, I believe Jerry's going to do um, a survey in a bit just to see who we have on the line with us, um, who, who's, who want to receive training and resources on how to best partner with families that they serve to the ultimate goal, I think, for both sides, for families and professionals, is to reach the best possible health care outcome for the family member. So it's sponsored by DSCC, uh, Illinois Chapter of the AAP, Illinois LEND, which um, I am a graduate of at, from UIC, and then um, the webinar will now begin. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. As um, Jerry mentioned, I, I do work at Blue Cross Blue Shield of um, HCSC. So what that means is I'm, I oversee government programs in five states. So a lot of my work is Medicaid and working with policymakers, legislators in, in the states of Illinois, Oklahoma, Montana, Texas, and New Mexico. And my role is to um, enhance Medicaid and stand up, stand up Medicaid in all of those states. We are growing and managed care is part of that growth when it comes to the Affordable Care Act and the growth in, in the recent years. And I'm, that's where I work now. Um, I do have to say as a disclaimer that this presentation is not um, uh, in any way reflective of, of the policies or, you know, thoughts of HCSC. This is strictly me um, as a parent telling you about my experience. But part of my experience has been really, um, has gotten me to do the work that I do both professionally and personally. So it's really hard for me to separate 
both of them. So I definitely uh, wanted to say that as far as with um, with the work that I do, even the work that I do day to day now, it's heavily influenced by my personal experience. And so I definitely wanted to, to say that uh, right at the beginning. And besides the work that I do now, I'll tell you a little, give you a little bit of my background, um, just so you know, um, experience-wise, what my professional partnerships with my, um, with the medical teams that I've had to interact with over the years, what I guess if you're a parent, what what you can do as well to show you that um, the reason that I've been able to be on certain councils and boards and that has been a lot of the times as a pre parent representative. Um, I'm currently um, on the board of uh, the ARC of Illinois. So the ARC is uh, the ARC of Illinois is a chapter, but it's a national organization that um, it, that promotes good policy and advocates for people with um, developmental and intellectual disabilities. I'm um, currently also on the board of um, the Auto Inflammatory Alliance. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. But that's actually a nonprofit that we formed in order to support. The, the syndrome or the disease that my daughter has and similar diseases around that. I'm on the advisory board to LEND. I also graduated from LEND. And LEND, um, for those of you that don't know, it's, it's, it's a national program. And um, it's basically kind of a course that you can take at um, the, your state's university center of excellence for people with developmental disabilities. And um, it ran in my when I took the course from the, from the fall to the spring, and we met regularly to talk about um, with professionals. I was there as a parent, but I had an opportunity and to work with, it was physical therapists, occupational therapists, nurses, developmental pediatricians. And um, it's a network that I really enjoy and still I'm very connected with. And I graduated from LEND, and I'm, now I'm on the, the advisory board of LEND. Um, so if, if any of you have any interest in, in being involved in that level, um, I, I encourage you to look up LEND and, and possibly apply to be one of the people that uh, goes through the program. So that's been a great experience. I work, I work closely with the Chicago Community Trust. About three years ago, I was appointed, nominated an appointment to, to work with them um, on their Persons with Disabilities Advisory Board. The Chicago Community Trust is the fourth largest foundation in the country. And they have a specific fund that serves uh, people with disabilities. And one of our biggest accomplishments this year has been doing a lot of work around ADA, ADA 25 Chicago. We've uh, funded several, you know, several events, several um, sponsorships to promote ADA 25 and commemorate what ADA 25, ADA has done in the last 25 years for people with disabilities. So those are those are a little bit about my involvement in some of the boards and councils now. In the past, the work that I've done um, that I that I always hold on to really closely is I was um, I was appointed to the Governor's Council on Early Intervention, and um, Early Intervention, as some of you may or may not may not know, um, it's for children with special health care needs from birth to three. And each state has um, a council that kind of gu that guides policy and best practice for early intervention in that state. And I was on it for several years, many years actually. And I'm not on it anymore. And my daughter and now, Kayla, she's 11. But I, went, I was on it when she was very young. And um, it was a great entryway into the world of policy making and advocacy and legislative work and how how to navigate that system to best promote um, the practices that support to very, very young children with uh, special health care needs and disabilities. So that's, that's a little bit of my involvement. And I'll tell you a little bit about Kayla. So my daughter Kayla, she's, um, she's wonderful. She's um, 11 now and she loves to play volleyball and dance and she takes piano and she's in yoga. Um, she enjoys spending time with her family and her cousins and loves to dance and um, she's she's been through a lot in the last years. She has a very rare and so now she has a very rare syndrome called NOMID. So NOMID is neonatal onset multi system inflammatory disease. 
Now, all that said, it's it's a very rare syndrome. Diagnosed, she's one of 67 in the world. She got diagnosed really when she was one, and at that time she was the youngest that has ever gotten diagnosed with a really rare syndrome, this really rare syndrome. And how we got there was really working closely with the doctors that supported us along the way. So this is why this webinar is so important to me because I really feel if I can tell that to um, a, either a professional or a parent, whomever is listening, then I can then you know you can see how my story story has evolved and why it's so important to me to have that relationship with um, with each other, one vice versa, the professional with the parent and vice versa. She, when she was very young, at about four months, I was already um, actually working in the early intervention system as an interpreter. That's kind of how it got started in EI. And it was about four months, and there was this, we knew there was something wrong. We didn't know exactly what it was, but we, we knew. You know, she was always crying and in a lot of pain. She had this rash that wouldn't go away. And we said, we have to, we have to start taking her to doctors. And we did. And, you know, it really taught me early on how important it was to have such good communication with the doctors that were supporting us at that time. So we started at about four months, and fast forward to about a year, we went to about 22 different specialists throughout the year. And we got diagnosed at um, now Lurie, um, but we got diagnosed by um, Dr. Listernick at Lurie. And if it wasn't for the support that we, would, that we got from her main pediatrician, who you'll see a picture of in a minute, Dr. Robert Anderson, that, that, who's still working at Elmhurst Memorial Healthcare, um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have been the same story. He was our key to, get her di to getting her diagnosis. There was many doctors who, you know, I think they thought that it was me. You know, they said, you know, I think you're just looking for something that's not there. I think you're just, you know, you know she's in pain. She's colicky. She's gassy. She's, you know, she maybe uh, she got bit by something and the rash was the reaction or maybe she was outside and a plant, you know, gave her an allergy. It was, it was a lot of that. But the key to really moving forward and getting her diagnosis was getting the support from the doctor that I had the most communication with. So I think that was key for me. So um, Kayla is um, doing well. She actually gets her doctor, her teams consist of a team at the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. Um, she has a team of doctors here in Chicago, Chicagoland area. And she has some specialists throughout the country, one at UPMC, another one in UCLA. And these are doctors that we've kind of had to follow because of her syndrome is so rare that we ended up at about a year getting diagnosed and going to the National Institutes, National Institutes of Health where she basically gets the key medical care that she needs to keep her alive. If it wasn't for the NIH, she, she probably wouldn't be here right now. She gets her medicine from there. Her key team is there. So that's, that's kind of the background story on Kayla and where, and where, we, where we started. And um, I'll kind of go along to where we are now. She's gotten the medicine. She's doing well. She's 11. She is very um, active and social. And, you know, we don't know what the future holds, but for now, um, we've gotten the best care that we can because of the team that supported us along the way. So now we'll go on to a little bit about what we'll, what we'll discuss in, in the presentation. Dorelia, are you ready for the poll? Sure. I think okay. that we can do that now. Mm -hmm. You could quick answer the question. It looks like we have mostly family members. Uh, the next is nurses and then specialty physicians. We have about 7% of that. Great. Um, yeah. 
Okay, good. Thanks, that's Thank it. You. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all for taking the poll. We'll talk a little bit about just the outline agenda for today. Like, you know, we'll we'll go through it and um, again, feel free. And Jerry, let me know. I, I've minimized the side screen. Let me know if there's any questions that come up that I should stop for. So, and we'll talk about definitions first. And we, I spoke a little bit about the NIH. And I see the NIH as our medical home. So the National Institutes of, of Health, basically, just to give you a little bit, bit of background, it's it's located in Bethesda, Maryland, and they have several institutes throughout um, throughout the national institutes. The one that we are most close closest to is the National Institutes of Arthritis and Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases, uh, NIMES, because that is where my daughter's syndrome falls. And National Institutes of Health funds research throughout the country. Actually, most of the money that the NIH received is actually given out to different uh, institutions throughout the country from, you know, it could be Northwestern, it could be, you know, another hospital, a large institution in Chicago to do research. They do research on everything from, you know, from cancer to Alzheimer's to um, my daughter's rare disease. They actually have an office of rare diseases at the NIH. And we are involved in a protocol there, and that's, I call, I see that as my medical home. So the, the medical home first emerged in, um, in pediatrics where it was recognized that children with special health care needs would benefit from, it's kind of a delivery model that, that coordinates the complex clinical um, and social service that many children require. And um, a medical home is, some, is a place, or a, 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 actually not a place, it's actually a model that's accessible, continuous, comprehensive, family-centered, coordinated, and compassionate and culturally effective. And it's it's delivered or directed by well-trained physicians who provide the primary care. And within a medical home, uh, managing the person, the child's care, in this children, in this case, the child's care, is, share, is a shared responsibility among the family and their primary care clinicians working together to implement specific care plans as a team. And that's how I see the NIH. The NIH is where we consider to be our medical home. We coordinate very closely with them, and even though we have a team of doctors here, a team of doctors at UPMC, UCLA, everything is kind of held and kind of coordinated within the NIH, and specifically NIME. Another, another um, part of our medical home or care is um, the team that supports the medical, the, the medical home model, and it's, um, it's a team-based and continuous quality. It's about continuous quality improvement. So the person on the left is Dr. Robert Anderson, who has been my daughter's pediatrician since she was born. And he has been um, key in, from her diagnosis to her care, to her advocate, to her um, anything we've ever wanted to coordinate. We, we start with him, and he is very key in coordinating with some of the team members on the right. On the right is um, in the long white coat, that's Dr. goldbach -Mansky. She is her main uh, doctor at the NIH. And this is a picture that we took at the Children's Inn. The Children's Inn is actually kind of like the Ronald McDonald house of the NIH. It's literally across the street. That's, this is where we stay because we do go to the NIH several times a year for Caleb's medical care. And um, so we'll go through just a couple people in the picture. So the long white coat, Dr. goldbach -Mansky. she is con in constant communication with her pediatrician, Dr. Robert Anderson. You know, every three months we have to go in for vitals because her medicine is uh, based on how she's growing and how much she weighs. So obviously we're not going to fly out to Bethesda every time we need to get vitals. So, you know, Dr. goldbach -Mansky and Dr. Anderson connect and Dr. goldbach -Mansky says, I need, you know, this type of CRP, this type of, you know, I want, you know, a white blood cell count, whatever she needs at that time, and we coordinate the care. We do all of that here, and then he coordinates, makes sure that the NIH gets it. Um, this is a very special day for us at the Children's Inn because the woman in the middle, she is not the current, but she is the past um, secretary of HHS. HHS is the federal agency that funds the National Institutes of Health. 
the man right on top of her with the blue shirt and the glasses, he is still um, Dr. Francis Collins. He is the director of the NIH. He has actually taken Kayla's story and um, he's, and you know, I, I was, was going to put pictures, more pictures, but I, I figured I could just tell you. And, and um, he has actually taken her story and has gone to President Obama with it. There's pictures of him with President Obama talking about Kayla and her story and how um, the care that we've gotten coordinated throughout the years has worked and the NIH has been obviously a part of that work. Uh, but he's mentioned Dr. Anderson, he's mentioned um, Lurie, and he's mentioned how the NIH really works to connect with, it's a real work for real people. Sometimes the NIH can be this like large institution with all these physicians and researchers and fellows from all over the world and everybody wants to come and do work there. But it's really at the end, it's about the person that you're going to serve, the person that you're going to hopefully save their life because that's exactly what happened with us. So that's, that's, the, that's, that's the picture on the right. So I wanted to make sure that I highlighted that. Family involvement. So family members on the phone. Um, to me, family involvement, enhancing connections with families, between families and their communities and the systems that serve them. So systems, by systems I mean it could be the school system, it could be the medical system, um, it could be your family support system, your natural supports are very important when it comes to family involvement. And all in the effort to increase positive outcomes for children with special health care needs. So that's the key. We're going to talk quickly about three levels of family involvement. Um, personal level, parent to parent, and system change. I've been involved in all three, and I'll, I'll highlight definitely um, the first and the second and the third, but right now I'll talk a little bit about the parent to parent support level. I would not have gotten to the NIH and to the care that we've gotten between Lurie, Elmhurst Memorial, and the NIH if it wasn't for number two, the parent to parent support level. Now, you know, imagine a young mom, first child, you know, culturally, my family's like, it's your milk, it's this and that. We don't know what it is, but it's in your head. She doesn't have anything. She doesn't have anything. Um, if it wasn't for other parents, I would never have gotten the care that I need. Parent-to-parent -parent connection is key um, to supporting a child with special health care needs. I say that because the reason we found out about the NIH with Dr. Lister and Lurie is basically because another parent who had been at his office three weeks before came from Florida to see Dr. Lister with the same symptoms as my daughter Kayla. She was at his office. Right after his office, she went to the NIH because she had no other way way to go. They diagnosed her at the NIH. And the mom had kept every single business card that her daughter, of, of every doctor that her daughter had seen over the years, trying to get a diagnosis. And so she sent a packet of information to the doctors. And then my doctor had gotten that packet three weeks before Kayla and I and her dad went to see him. And if it wasn't for that mom getting that information, Dr. Lister Neck, because when we went and said, look, she gets this rash, she's always in pain, she has fevers every night, she's had a seizure, we don't, we, because of the fevers, we don't know what to do. And his answer to me, he said, it's one of two things. It's either a very rare form of cancer, we have to start chemo today, basically, or it's this really rare syndrome, and I only know like a little bit about it because this mom sent me a packet of information, and if it is this syndrome, NOMID, She's one of 15 in the world with it. And what I can do is I can connect you with this mom who sent me this packet and see, you know, what she did next. And that's exactly how the care started with Kayla. Two weeks later, I was at the NIH. And within a day of being at the NIH, she got the same medicine that she takes today every day. And her, literally, her rash has not been back since. The fever stopped. Um, she had already lost a vision in one eye. She had already lost a, vision, um, a little bit of hearing. All of those symptoms stopped because um, of the care that, you know, he didn't have to tell me that. You know, he, I'm sure he, he took a risk in, in saying that because 
you know, he's just kind of referring me to another mom. He's, you know, he, and and he did the right thing. You know, he he said after he said I was going to say it. I wasn't, you know, but sometimes I feel doctors do want to have all the answers, and um, it's part of what's what they've trained for. And uh, but I also am here to say that it's okay if if they don't. It's okay to say it, it could be this, but I really have no idea. But even if I don't know what it is, I'm going to support you by at least giving you a resource to move forward with so you feel that you've got the best care possible. So that's, um, so that's the family support, personal parent and systems change. Direct relationship with service providers, that's key in order to move forward with any um, type of either special health care need. It doesn't even have to be a diagnosis. So this is more any type of special health care need. You may not have a diagnosis. I say that all the time. Not every every symptom has something that has to be named. Family professional partnerships among the provider, the care team, the patient, person, and the family is key. Family professional partnerships between families um, and providers. There has to be two-way collaboration support always. Probably the most important one is mutual re trust and respect because you know, they, you as a parent are going to know your child better than anyone. The professional is going to know their profession and what they can do to support you in getting um, the, the help that you need for your child. Clear communication is extremely key because if it wasn't for the communication that I had to have along the way, I would have never, I'd probably still be searching for a diagnosis. One of the first doctors I saw with Kayla she was progressing so quickly in her in her syndrome that they told me she wouldn't live to see ten you know and she's and she's eleven so i'm I'm extremely grateful over the years to be able to communicate um, what I thought was going on with her, what they thought was going on with her, and then we kind of would come to an agreement of okay, maybe we both don't know we have to keep looking a lot of it was those types of conversations. Uh, Value-based care, I talk about that just because in, in my work even now, I think about it as I make policies and changes in policies for people with special health care needs in, in my work even every day now. Uh, Value-based care, for patients and families, this is safe, appropriate, and effective care with enduring results at a reasonable cost for both, not just for insurance companies like mine, it's for both. For medical staff, it means employing evidence based medicine and proven treatments and techniques that take into account the patient's wishes and pre preferences. So that's what value-based care, the basis of it is. Family-centered care, it approves health outcomes, enhances family and staff satisfaction, increases patient's ability to manage care, it's, more effect it's a more effective use of health care resources, and decreases health care costs. And I don't say that just because I work at Blue Cross Blue Shield, I say that because I've, I've I've gotten in over the years in, in ex sometimes extreme medical debt um, because I didn't know, I learned, had to learn kind of the hard way throughout the years how to navigate that system. You know, when you have a doctor who's at UPMC and the insurance company says, no, why can't you see a doctor here? Why do you have to go to the University of Pittsburgh? And, and navigating and kind of advocating, has, it comes with time and, and skill and um, other parents. Nobody taught me how to do an insurance appeal at an insurance company. It was another mom who said, "Oh, this is what I did." <laughs> it was, you know, it was a Facebook group that we have that's private and says, "Hey, you know what? I'm having trouble getting this medicine covered." So it's always the other parent who has been the most helpful in kind of navigating what what we need to do in order to get the, the medicine that we needed for for Kayla's care. Benefits for children. Obviously, better attendance at school, um, more positive attitudes, behavior, more opportunities to be included in the community. Inclusion is something that's very important to me when it comes to to um, to, to people in general with special health care needs. I think both learn, in my case with my daughter, you know, she's at an age now that you know, it's kind of up to her what she wants to tell her teacher about her syndrome or not. Does she, she's blind in one eye. Does she need to sit up front and closer to a certain side of the room in order to see better? Yes, but she is at the point now that she's had to learn to kind of advocate for herself and or not. 
you know, it's she she doesn't have to, you know, you know, wear you know, nomad as like as a badge everywhere she goes. She she it, it's her story to tell at this age. You know, I actually um it didn't work out, but she was actually going to present with me today just a couple of slides and and um it didn't work out for this reason or that, but you know, she did say she goes, "Well, I definitely want them to know that, um, you know, I have a story to tell too. It's not just your story, mom. It's my story too." And I always take that with me because, even before this presentation, I said, "This is a presentation. This is what I'm going to say. Are you okay with it?" And she and she read it, and we looked at it, and you know, she changed a few things. Um, but I I, I want to empower her to also have the opportunity to say yes. You can say that, or no, I don't want you to say that, or no, I don't like that picture, or take that picture. I had other pictures in the presentation. She didn't like any of them, so I took them out. Um, so, you know, it's it's partly her story to tell, especially now. I'll just include a little bit about, um, you know, um, the NIH and the study that they've done. I, I believe wholeheartedly um, for the parents on the phone, and I'm sure the doctors already know, if you ever have any questions about, um, you know, diagnoses or questions about medical care, my go-to is always the NIH website because it really, it really has given me a world of, of information, the latest, the latest research, anything that I need to know about care, I always go directly to the NIH. So this is um, benefits for children. I'll, I won't read the whole thing. I'll go down to the conclusion. Participants who adopted new forms of delegation and care processes using teamwork approaches and who were supported with resources system support, data feedback, reported improved provider satisfaction and productivity. There, appe there appears to be a need for more on-site teamwork training. So this is this webinar is kind of what I see as kind of that, um, you know, teamwork training, not on-site, but part of training. And um, the benefits are abound, as we saw on the last slide, for, for children um, to coordinate their care. When parents especially are fully engaged and working with the child at home and being involved in the system, um, you know, to become better advocates for stronger services for their child, the whole community uh, reaps the benefits. That's, that's the key in supporting um, children. Benefits for parents. There's more confidence in the agencies or, and, you know, I've worked for years and before Blue Cross Blue Shield in the nonprofit world, and then I worked for the state of Illinois at the Department of Human Services. You know, the the most effective parents um, were the ones that were the mo were informed, you know, informed and also engaged because they they were able to leverage us, quote unquote, for better services, for better policies, for more funding in order to support them and their children. Um, greater confidence in themselves, social networks that they can access to create more opportunities for the children, whether it be uh, inclusive parks or inclusive daycares or, or you know, supporting parents in different settings that involve many other parents, you know, parent groups, things like that. Management skills, they transfer to home. Uh, knowledge of how to influence decisions made in community and state. And that last bullet point uh, takes years to kind of navigate and learn, in my view, uh, but that's been key in being able to make better policies for, for children um, overall. Benefits for providers and the system. Systems, again, medical systems, other systems that support us. Policies are developed that respond directly to family and the child in need. Personnel, nurses included, have higher morale when they feel much more connected to the end result of the patient's care. I've seen that firsthand. Um, they have better reputations, uh, example again, um, Elmhurst, Elmhurst Hospital, um, the NIH, they, they you know, the good, good news spreads quickly among parents, so I think that's key for systems and they'll want to go to that system. I can't tell you how many people I referred um, to Dr. Anderson since, um, since Kayla's been born. I mean, probably, I can't even count, but, you know, people, well, I'm looking for, I'm having a baby, I'm looking for a good pediatrician. I'm like, I have one for you. <laughs> this is what you should see. You know, and he's grateful too, and he, and it shows, you know, so it's been a good relationship over the years. Healthcare systems, they are involved in is stronger. I think, um, as I've worked over the years, the best decisions of uh, that policies and decisions that have been made have been made because the stakeholder is put at the beginning of whatever decision has to be made. 
so I've seen that in systems um, throughout the years for sure. <clears throat> Providers that promote family professional partnerships, welcoming to all families, communicate effectively with diverse families, that's key to me, work to engage families and partners, accommodate parents' work schedules, collaborate with community leaders, maintain regular communication with home. So those are all keys that I've seen firsthand. Challenges. Why do some families hesitate? And maybe some families on the phone could relate. You know, there's many a times that I've hesitated to say something myself, and I say, well, you know, um, they're going to think, oh, here she comes again. Oh, you know, I, there's been times that I've gone to see a new doctor, and the second question, I, when, as after I'm, you know, kind of asking questions and this and her blood level and her white blood, and they're like, are you a nurse? And I'm like, no. Are you a doctor? I said, no. You know, so I, you also, I'm also careful not to, not to be so strong that I'm kind of telling them what they're supposed to be telling me. I'm respectful of, of their role and their space, and um, that's been effective for me to build that rapport with them. Um, sometimes families hesitate because they don't want, you know, to be rejected or they don't want to be like, oh, here comes that, that mom. I don't want her to, you know, be in my room, you know, you take her or whatnot. Um, they're afraid the voices won't make a difference when it's really the opposite is, is true. Um, being blamed for concerns about my child, that happened to me over and over. You know, culturally it was, you know, you're just a first-time mom, you know, it's Stop nursing her. It's your milk. You know, it was that was a lot of it, but slowly yeah. came out of it stronger. When with all these experiences, it was, it was much stronger at the end. Hinder, uh, factors that hinder partnerships. Um, attitude that we already do that. Concerns about confidentiality, resistance to change, lack of resources, time, money, lack of trust communication, fear, and culture. Culture is huge just because I take that always into consideration when I when I work with families. There are some cultures that are um, much more in tune with what they want as a whole. And a quick example is, you know, there's been times that when Kayla was young that I was not getting the answers here. So I went to Mexico, and I said, you know, in the U.S., they just, you know, I, I don't know what to do. They just tell me that it's me or that we can't find diagnosis. Um, so I got to a point that I did go just to see if there was somebody else out there, even in my own home country, that could diagnose her. And what what I saw with that care is that it's, they in, in, in Mexico at least, they, they start very much with, Everything around the person, not really the person. They'll ask you, you know, are you are you going through anything? Are you sleeping? Are you eating? Are you, you know, um, how's the relationship with the house? So, you know, is there any stress in your life? Are you working? They'll start kind of with that holistic view of care, and then they bring it back to the person and how it will affect that person. So culture is something that I take strongly into consideration when um, I've had to support families in whatever it is, in appeals and navigating doctor relationships and, and getting them support that they need for the medical care. Culture is, is something that's key. Successful. Factors that contribute to successful family partnerships. Communication, decisions that are together. Be willing to negotiate or compromise. Acknowledge each other's skills and expertise, as I mentioned before. Being inclusive. And always, always, always respecting each other's point of, point of view. I just always be able to remind yourself that their experience is not your experience, and vice versa. Everybody brings to the table the what they've what they've um, been able to experience, and that's where you start. You just start with that with that with that premise in mind. They learn from each other. <clears throat> There's a shared agenda, which should be the child. Um, Create action items. That happened to me a lot. If we don't, if you don't feel in a month that this isn't working, then come back. Things like that. Whatever it is, you know, massage. You know, massages that they wanted me to do with the physical therapy appointments. Things like that. Um, 
Use evidence-based research, articles, data, stories that make a case for change. <clears throat> Evaluate where you are in the process, sharing your successes with others. This is <clears throat> one of the reasons I wanted to do this. Sharing my successes has been um, key in other people's stories and you know, kind of navigating what they need to do for their child. <clears throat> as parents, we can be looked at as the ones with the most needs. We can be the star of the show or the showstopper many times. Parents often question themselves and their capabilities because they are thinking about what the professionals are thinking of them. We should remember that all have the same goal. We, have made, we may have different experiences, different ways of verbally expressing it, and different points of view, but we all want the same thing, the best outcome for the child. How to best communicate with professionals who support your child? Collaboration is key. Respecting each other, especially the skill and knowledge that each bring to the table. It's not the professional, it's also the parent. The parent has, um, is with the child, you know, obviously all the time. It's listening to what is going on in the home to support the child is key. Developing that trust, open communication, cultural traditions, you know, Compromise. Remember to start always with the child in mind. Cultural, cultural tradition is this key. When I was get, trying to go throughout and get her diagnosis, in my own family, very many times there, there's, um, you know, there's this this belief in Mexico. It's called stampachada. Basically, means there's something stuck in the gut of the child, and that's why they're not eating. Or you know, my daughter was considered a failure to thrive for her first you know, year, year and a half of life. And so, you know, in Mexico, or my grandmother's or her grandmother was, no, oh, Sampachada, Sampachada. And so what it was is basically that you, they do kind of this rubbing of the stomach with warm oil, and then they kind of like tug a little bit at the stomach to try to uh, dislodge whatever's in there. And um, I, I kind of, you know, I don't, I, don't I, I, I was neutral to it. To me, I said, if, as long as they're not hurting her physically, like it's not, you know, it's not painful for her, a massage could probably feel good, that's fine. You know, do what you do, what makes, you know, the unit feel better. The unit, I mean, my grandmother's, her grandmother, my parents, if they feel like they want to massage it and put warm oil and, you know, press it a certain way to get whatever's dislodged so she can finally eat, I went with it. It's not, a conventional, there's nothing proven about it, but um, I respected my cultural traditions um, so they can also, uh, you know, you get to a point when you're trying to find this diagnosis that, you know, that everybody's just really trying to to know, do the best they can without causing harm. And so I just went with it. And that's, and that's, there's a lot of traditions that I've seen like that over the years, you know, certain prayers that people have done and things like that. And at the end, you know, I, the best, the best, um, you know, therapist that we were seeing at the time with early intervention would come, and I would tell them, and they would be like, "Oh, that's great. Yeah, sure. Yeah, let them, let them, let them massage her stomach. Let them, you know, um, say a prayer. Let them, you know, it's just part of them trying to help." And I just went with it, and it was, it was very helpful for, for me to hear that from the people that supported Kayla early on, being proactive. Keeping information organized. There's so many def different ways to keep information nowadays. Um, I had a big binder. Now there's apps. There's notebooks. Um, recognize our responsibility to make things happen, to make sure that they happen when they should. Um, doing homework is key for parents and, and prior to an appointment. You know, you know, you already know what they're going to ask. You know, when did she last eat, or when was her last fever, or what, 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 what medicine is she on? Being prepared and kind of that makes always the appointment go so much smoother when, when you have kind of all the answers, you know, that you know they're going to ask right in front of you. That's key. I would always take a little notebook and say, okay, you know, she, she had this test last or she had this, this appointment last and this is what they said and this is the doctor and this is the results and, you know, um, this is the person you can call in order if you want me to sign, you know, the release so they can send you the results. Um, that always made my appointments go so much smoother with, the, with my doctors. Share concerns that you have. Never would leave the office without, I would always write down questions that I would have, you know, and I would ask, um, 
the nurses were key, I think, in a lot of my daughter's care. Doctors were great too, but sometimes the nurses had more time. So a lot of the questions I would have would be directly to the nurse. You know, before the doctor came in, the doctor would come in and, you know, the nurse would be, oh, yeah, we covered that. Yep, we covered that. And that that was key. Nurses are, are, are key to, to the care that we've received over the years. We typically seek first to be understood. Most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen to the with the intent to reply. They're either speaking or preparing to speak. They're filtering everything through their own lens is the key. So I, I've seen that a lot with, um, with certain doctors throughout the years, not my core team, but other doctors. Because I think if I've seen, if I would see that with the doctor that I, that I have, I would definitely be cautious and probably want to find another doctor. I, I always have looked for those doctors who really listen to where I was in her care, you know, and that's changed the outcome for Kayla over the years uh, for the better. Compromise and communication. You walk in with a clear mind. Um, ask, always ask if you're unclear about what's being said. Sometimes doctors and nurses and you know are quick. They just they, they they have a full schedule. They have to get on to the next the next appointment. Um, but always write down questions. I would say before walking in, so you're clear on anything that um, needs to be explained. Acronyms are huge in the medical field. Always clarify. Be present. Ask for things to be repeated if um, if just to make sure you're your understanding everything. Compromising. The most important trip you take in life is meeting people halfway. And a lot of the medical care is meeting people halfway, meeting families where they are, and then supporting them where they are. If, if they're not ready, you know, for that next really um, major appointment that they have to, the daughter had to take like this bariatric treatment and she had to be put in like in a papoose, several times and, and just to make sure that there was nothing going on with her stomach before she got her diagnosis and and just to see her in that state. And after like the third time at Loyola, I, I just said, I can't, I, I can't do it right now. Just give me another, you know, another week, <laughs> you know, give me some time and, you know, navigated and doctors were supportive, said, okay, you know, when you're ready to come back to do that test, we'll do it. And that was the best outcome. Pain, uh, person centered is key to all the care that we've gotten over the years. Um, child's needs that we've known have to be key in what we know about the child. Um, sharing what you want for them, knowing what you want and what value you can add to the team. Compromising is key. Um, coming fully prepared, leaving a lot of the emotions at the door is hard to do, but that's important to do because. Um, you don't want emotions to get in the way of what you're trying to accomplish that day at the, at the office, the medical office. Personal references out of the conversation, always start with common ground, compromising, listening, um, always demonstrating attitude of co cooperation and saying, you know, at the end, this is about my child and what, ha what we have to do to make the best, the best outcome happen for them. That would be the key. Focusing on what either next steps, there's not always a solution. Focusing on next steps is key, or the solution. Maybe there is. Maybe there's something that they're thinking, and but that focusing on that is a good way. Diversity, culture again is key. Values, experiences, actions, and words don't always have the impact we intend. You can say something, and the doctor, or the nurse, or the family member, vice versa, is key. If the doctor says something, um, you know, sometimes it's it's in a rush and you say something and not thinking of what the family member has in their mind already. Uh, recognize that many people communicate and process information differently. What you explain to a family member about their child, um, it could be a first time mom who doesn't know, the only experience she has is this healthcare world that she's trying to navigate or he's trying to navigate and knowing that could be really key in getting the care that the child needs. Internalizing different cultural approaches. Those, it's just different to, to different people. So these are just the standards, standards for system of care for children with youth and special health care needs. Um, there's several domains, and the one we're talking about is the one highlighted in the yellow, family for professional partnerships. I also spoke a little bit um, on the left second Second up from the left is medical home because I think they a lot of these absolutely tie in together. 
so I thought it was key to bring them up. And um, But we are talking specifically today about the Family Professional Partnership domain. Opportunities to get involved. There's advisory committees. There's um, how and when youth and family involvement um, can be involved into the office. It doesn't always have to involve a committee. If you see something at um, uh, many times I've called the Elmhurst Hospital the patient care line and said, you know, I saw this. It could be a, something as simple as, you know, a sign that needs to be rewarded to be more uh, inclusive. You know, it could, the opportunities are abound and we're running out of time, but if you want to discuss more about um, where, where you can fit in to, to advocate for policies and procedures, then I, just contact me after this and we can, we can talk further. Partner with other parents and community organizations for systems change. You know, my example would be like the ARC, the Auto Inflammatory Alliance, organizations like that that have supported me over the years. For the sake of our children, we must strive to be patient for those whose experiences have not given them access to our perspective. It is our duty to guide people to fully understand beauty and the ability within our children. To do this, we must become effective advocates. To become effective advocates, we must educate ourselves on what we need for our child, what the best outcome would be for them. Family involvement. Families have to be valued as visionaries and pioneers for their families. They should, I do, encourage question the status quo, quo to get the best care possible. Families from diverse communities must be involved. Families must build interdependent relationships with multiple stakeholders that also seek to enhance the quality of life for children with special health care needs. So we'll go to the acknowledgments. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak to all of you. Um, National Center for Family and Professional Partnerships, DSCC, AAP, and LEND have been a key part of the presentation today.